My name's Shannon and I'm one of the staff at Kairos, so I want to welcome you to this Migrant Justice webinar. And with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to Connie to give us an overview of the situation at this point. Thank you very much, Shannon, and welcome everyone. My name is Connie Sorio. I am the coordinator of the Migrant Justice Program at Kairos. Um, this is a series of webinars that we started uh, towards the end of March, and so far, this is the fourth. So uh, for the new uh, participants, uh, I just want to give you a bit of a summary of you know, what the three previous webinars were. Um, the first two webinars, we talk about, you know, the general uh, situation of uh, temporary foreign workers in Canada as they are impacted by, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, many of them were losing jobs, were terminated, and many of them were not able to access or are still not able to access, you know, EI and uh, the Canadian Emergency Response uh, Benefit. We, at the first two webinars, we invited speakers from the different provinces. So we had Anne Whitley from the Cooper Institute based in PEI. We had Tiwa Marcelino from Manitoba, he's with Migrante Canada. And we also had with us Roland and uh, Gina Moreno from New Brunswick. We had Santiago Escobar from uh, the United Food and Commercial Workers uh, Union. Uh, to give us, you know, and gave us an update on what's happening in their particular uh, provinces as far as their work with temporary foreign workers, you know, were concerned. At the last, at the first two webinars, we, we heard about, you know, the situation of uh, agricultural workers, those under the Seasonal Agricultural Workers Program, uh, how we we were very concerned about, you know, uh, their situation, particularly their accommodation and access to health and safety um, tools, uh, as, uh, you know, in relation to the public uh, health advisory. The third, uh, also the second webinar, we had uh, Claire Rook uh, of the CCR, the Canadian Council on Refugees spoke about, you know, the situation of uh, refugee claimants and how they were impacted by, they're impacted by um, the pandemic. The third webinar we had with us, you know, the third webinar was focused on personal support workers, health workers and caregivers. And we had three uh, caregivers who shared with us their experiences. And I, well, one of the stories I want to lift, you know, is the story of um, Jasser. Jasser um, is an international student who's here in Canada, but he is a registered nurse in the Philippines and responding to the shortage of, you know, workers in long-term health uh, facilities. He responded and worked in one. And after a week of working there, he contracted the virus. And unfortunately, he was not, you know, provided with any health uh, support because his, uh, his OHIP was not active at the time and he has no, you know, he, he has no access to EI and CERB. And despite that fact, you know, uh, how he felt uh, not supported during the time that he has the virus, immediately after that he was, you know, he was declared safe. He went back to work to the long-term care facility again, responding, you know, to, to the need for workers. And I've spoken to, to Jasser. Um, he's, he's just happy to be able to do what he's supposed to do as a healthcare professional. So from, from the three webinars, you know, uh, that we've had, um, Workers, temporary workers, and you know, uh, advocates shared the work that they're doing, their experiences, and you know, uh, supported the Kairos advocacy call uh, for for the Canadian government to step up and really ensure that temporary workers have access to EI, the CERB, healthcare, and other 
uh, aid and uh, benefit packages that you know we're supposed to get under this pandemic. So this fourth webinar uh, we will be focusing on you know the advocacy side. We call Kairos call for residency, and we have as Shannon you know mentioned earlier we have with us uh, uh, various speakers. And also we have with us today, uh, Jennifer Henry, our executive director of I'll just give a bit of a background about NEMI. Uh, so I got a call this morning uh, from a friend who asked me if it's okay for NEMI to call me or Marisa. And I said, yes. And then, you know, when I, when I first talked to Marisa, she was frantic. She was crying because, you know, the employer kept on harassing her and threatening her to call the police on her. And, and she, you know, she, she didn't know what to do. And so I, I asked her to come down and I said that, you know, I'll try to find a labor lawyer who can help her and, you know, file a complaint uh, with the Ministry of Labor. You know, she hasn't slept because, you know, the employer kept on harassing her. And, and she's, yeah, she told me she's not feeling very well. And she was afraid at the beginning to join the webinar. But I told her that, you know, it might help her to sh just to be able to share her story and find support from the people who are here in the webinar. Thanks, Connie. I mean, we're in, in the between in betweens, right? In between trying to do one-to-one um, -one advocacy for people who are really struggling, of which there are, are many, and NEMI is one. And to try to also push up to the bigger issues to hope to have some impact that might impact a, a larger group of people. And so, um, but your voice at the end of the phone is kind of uh, <laughs> both and, right? And so we appreciate uh, your solidarity on all of our behalf. Um, it's hard though, it's hard, no. Um, I think I was supposed to speak a little about the campaign and so maybe I will just do that. Um, we're a little group, so uh, I'll just share relatively informally. Um, the way I have been thinking about these last, uh, weeks. Uh, I realize we're going into week 10 in my counting this this week. Um, is really that <sighs> this very dislocated time and time in, in very much uh, we can characterize by the word crisis. Um, this dislocated time gives us uh, two opportunities. In one way, um, it's kind of uh, x-ray vision on the injustices of the moment, right? We can see clearer perhaps than we ever have or clearer than we have in a long time, where the vulnerabilities are, what communities aren't supported, where the injustices sit, um, and uh, where the inequities uh, can be so clearly documented. And it, in some ways we have this kind of x-ray vision into what's important and what's not, right, in this context. So the importance of essential workers, the importance of health, the importance of housing, of shelter, the importance of stable uh, situations in terms of rights and protections uh, and the capacity to access government services. Um, so we have that on the one hand, and that is the classic, you know, of, of that comes from crisis is that kind of clarity, uh, that x-ray vision into the uh, situation. But we also have this little, little tiny window um, that's the possibility side. The possibility that maybe, maybe in this moment when people have this kind of x-ray vision, we could generate collectively the empathy necessary to shift things for the future, right? And, uh, and the dislocation is such that we could even dream of something bigger than maybe we've ever dreamt, dreamt before of what could be possible in terms of change. I mean, we have changed so much in the last uh, 10 weeks, uh, changed in ways we couldn't have possibly believe, believed 
to try and preserve people's health. And I think with some kind of commitment to the common good, not perfect, but some kind of commitment. So how else could we change for the future to really make a, a contribution to a different uh, a different planet and a, a right relation with both peoples and the earth. So that's the context into which I think about this campaign. Um, we're trying to, we know that people are looking at the issues affecting migrant workers because very in practical terms, it's about their food supply, it's about their care, of personal service workers, it's about the care of elderly, it's a caregivers. Um, and so people are, are maybe uh, empathetic in ways that they may have not been before, or at least they're aware. Aware and awareness has the potential of generating empathy. And, uh, and uh, there is this openness, a possible openness to think about doing things differently. And we just have to kind of walk through that door with as much uh, strength as we can and really try to keep that door as wide open as we can. So I think that, you know, our dream is, is a path to permanent residency for every migrant uh, worker who comes to Canada who is essential to who we are as a, as a country and as a, a, a peoples. Um, and so we want to hold out that commitment. Uh, and we want to do that in the short term by asking for the government to provide permanent residency pathway, residency essentially right now, and all of the benefits that come from that in ways that uh, other places around the globe, such as Portugal, have done to deal with the crisis in this moment. So it's like we need to open the door for the really big vision, but go through it as far as we can right now uh, by getting a residency that would, would assist the needs of uh, people in this time and treat all folks who are doing the essential work that is required um, with the same rights and benefits in this moment. Um, so I would say let's hold on to the big dream and work hard at the interim step towards that big dream and hope that by potentially inhabiting that place, we can see how it's possible to change things uh, on that larger scale. So that's, that's all I was going to say. <laughs> We're also going to have um, a story from Reg McQuaid. And then later on, there will be some time for questions and answers where we can have a bit more of a uh, conversation among people. So Reg, I would invite you to unmute yourself and uh, tell us your thoughts about migrant workers and your personal experience. Uh, my personal experience is one, uh, I live amongst 220 staff in a, a, a retirement residence. We have a 400 residents of whom 20% are long-term care. And uh, there are 160 staff in the care section are caregivers and there's 60 workers in the uh, food service and uh, just you know from my observation i would say easily 90 to 95 percent of them uh, were born outside the country and uh, in fact, uh, shortly after <clears throat> Connie asked me this morning if I could say a few words, uh, there was a rap on the door and uh, this uh, young woman was taking my temperature. So I said, do you mind if I ask you a personal question? And she said, no. I said, do you, uh, are you a permanent resident? She said, yes, I have permanent residency. So I said, do you know Connie Sorio? She said, yes. So I, I said, then she said, I, I said, I, I'm going to be going to this webinar. She said, oh, I'd like to go too. <laughs> but that was, 
she had to run along the corridor and take other people's temperature. But uh, that is our uh, experience here, that uh, our, we've been in lockdown for, uh, I think, nine weeks. And uh, other than the past couple of weeks, we've been allowed to go out to, the, uh, for, to have a walk in, in the neighborhood. Uh, but other than that, <coughs> Uh, we are confined to our apartments and all our basic needs are cared for by people who come to bring us food, they do our laundry, they take away the, uh, the garbage and anything else that we need. They're there like angels of mercy, so to speak. These are the essential people. So, uh, Jennifer was saying how the situation we're in lays bare the injustices, the underlying injustices in our society, which we have accepted too readily. Uh, they got kind of lost because there are great injustices in many areas, but uh, the, as it was mentioned, uh, the agricultural workers and, and uh, food service workers and uh, personal support workers, caregivers. These are what we need just to, to live. And uh, if these people, if, anyhow, it's exploitation, pure and simple. We, we know well enough that the reason it's like this is because uh, if, People don't have permanent residency. If they are temporary, they are more easily exploitable. They have fewer rights, they have fewer recourse, they can be sent home, and all this and all that. So it is an injustice. And uh, I, I'm reminded again by Jennifer's remarks about uh, Naomi Klein's um, a book, uh, Shock Doctrine where she, she was telling about 10 years or so ago where the, the forces of, the, of darkness like to take, make use of a sh sh uh, shock uh, situations to push through their agenda and kind of to in, uh, install uh, structures that we will have to live under with negative consequences for decades, so to speak. But the other side of it is, as Jennifer was alluding to, uh, it can be a time when things are like in, in a, let's say a shock situation, we're doing things in a way that we never dreamed we could, that we, we can, people can start thinking like what we've been doing is not acceptable. We don't want to go back to, to, the, to, to normal. We want to go back to a new way. And uh, here in uh, Christie Gardens, uh, as I'm considering what I've heard and all that, and, and Jennifer's appeal uh, that uh, there are, as I said, 400 residents here. Uh, many of them, I would estimate at least half are university graduates, I would say maybe three quarters. Uh, but uh, if we could add our voices to the campaign that you're, if you're, uh, that you're uh, uh, launching here, uh, it will do help to do our small part. Uh, as uh, you may know that uh, we have a, a very senior cabinet minister here as a member of parliament. She drops by about three times a year and tells us what wonderful things the government is doing. So uh, next time she shows her nose, or even before that, uh, she'll get an earful. And uh, uh, just uh, again, Talking of Zoom, I just uh, an hour ago, I was on a Zoom with uh, a, a, a group of caregivers. And so uh, 
not caregivers, yeah, caregivers. We are caregivers, uh, internal caregivers, so to speak. And uh, I told them about this uh, uh, webinar and, and what your campaign is, and there was quite a bit of interest. So anyhow, I'll just leave it there. And I, I must say about naming uh, the uh, case, the young woman, you know, I think we should really stand by her whatever way we can eh? and uh, others like her. So thank you for allowing me to share my small experience of this. Thank you so much, Reg. It's really great to have that close up perspective. And, and I would say Reg has been, you know, and continues to be a huge supporter uh, for caregivers and their call for permanent residency. Um, Reg has been telling me that, you know, uh, many of the caregivers there, although he, she ha he hasn't asked everyone, but most of them <laughs> are still on temporary, on temporary status. And, and Reg, I would say 80% would know me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 yeah. um, Sharon, uh, Sharon has, uh, yeah, she has a story to re read. Uh, also an update from the previous, you know, uh, caregiver who shared her story. Great. So thank you all. And thank you very much, Reg, for that. And it's good to see you, by the way. It's Cheryl. Hi. Um, so I've been asked to um, read the story of Carol. And we, in the last webinar, we did read her story, but there is an update. So I will, for those of you who have not heard the story, I will, I will um, give the account from last last time. And this was um, written at the end of March or around that time. And then I will provide an, a very quick update to her situation. My name is Carol. I am 45 years old, separated with three children left in the care of my parents in the Philippines. I was a public high school teacher in the Philippines, but my salary was not enough to support my children and my aging parents. I was forced to leave teaching and left the country as an overseas Filipino worker. I worked in Saudi Arabia for eight years as a nanny and domestic helper. The first couple of years of being separated from my children was very difficult. It was heart-wrenching. Not to mention the way nannies and domestic workers are treated there. What sustained me was the fact that I was able to send money home so my children could go to school have a decent and safe housing and food on the table. I came to Canada in May 2018 as a temporary foreign worker under the Care for the Elderly pilot program. I had to pay about $8,000 to an agency who found me an employer and processed all my documents. My job was to provide care for and companionship for an elderly person. My dream is to finish the 24 months work requirement, pass the language tests and be able to apply for permanent residency and re reunite with my children. We were doing really well. My employer was very happy with my job and the way I looked after her. There was only two of us in the house and on weekends during my days off, I had to go out to do my groceries and errands. A reliever came to look after her. We were respectful of each other. I learned to care for her like my mother. This, however, abruptly disrupted when in mid-March, the eldest daughter decided to bring her to a long-term care facility. My employer and myself were both shocked and did not know how to react. The day my employer was brought to the, to the nursing home, she asked me to accompany her. I could not describe how I felt when we got to the nursing home and were leaving her there. On our way out, we were advised by the in-house medical practitioner to follow the public health advisory to self-isolate for 14 days and physical distancing because the facility was dealing with a COVID-19 outbreak. As soon as we reached home where I stayed with my employer, the daughter told me to look for another employer and vacate the premises in three days. 
I was shocked and devastated. Where would I go? Where would I find a new employer at this time of the pandemic? I pleaded with her and explained that I did not have any relatives or anyone that could provide temporary accommodation, but she did not relent. On the third day, the daughter phoned me and asked me if I was ready to leave and gave me instructions where to leave the house key. Pushed to the wall, I told her I am not leaving. I reminded her of the medical practitioner's advice to self-isolate for 14 days and the physical distancing. I told her that if she forced me to leave, I will report her to the authorities, including the Ministry of Labor for violating my rights. I think she was stunned. She could not speak for almost a minute. And then she said, okay. I felt really good to stand my rights for my rights. Right now, I am still living in the same house and I was assured that the family would honor the remaining time of the two year contract. Meantime, my employer, Nana, I call her Nana for grandmother, wants to come home. She feels safer in the house with me caring for her than in the nursing home still fighting the, the virus outbreak. So that was then. She's given an update. So she was terminated uh, and asked to leave the premises on May 12th despite the employer's promise to keep me to honor the two-year contract. I was also asked to return my salary from April 15 to the 30th, and I was not paid for the two weeks work I did in May prior to my termination. I did not say this before and did not make any complaints because I did not know how much the employers can legally deduct from salaries to cover for my food and accommodation. The employer deducted $320 every two weeks for food and accommodation when the legalized amount is $83 per week. I am temporarily staying with a friend and feeling stuck. It is very hard to find a new employer at this moment and cannot apply for EI because my employer does not want to issue my record of employment. That is her story. Certainly, we are. Um... Glad to still be in touch with Carol, um, but obviously an awful story. Connie, I wanna know if you wanted to give an IRCC update before we go into question time. So basically what have been, you know, uh, experiencing and the stories we've been receiving from migrant workers, not only in the GTA area, but also outside of the country, um, is the fact that despite, you know, the announcements of, uh, of these aid packages and emergency support, temporary foreign workers continue to be excluded from accessing uh, these benefits. And many of them have had been terminated, laid off from work, with nowhere to go and no access to any assistance or emergency food aid. Um, they're living with, you know, friends and really wanting to, um, to reinstate their work so that they could provide uh, continued support to their families back home. And I'm not just talking about, you know, uh, workers from the Philippines, but workers from different countries outside of Canada. So this continues to be a problem. And recently, uh, IRCC or the Immigration, Refugee and Citizenship Canada had been announcing, you know, um, policy changes to ensure that those who were terminated from work are able to get new employer immediately and able to process and get their renewed or work permit, uh, new work permits. But again, uh, on the ground, uh, workers are having difficulty being able to get employers, employers who are willing to sponsor them and willing to stand and apply new work permits for these uh, workers. We are also receiving news that those who are, who have applied for uh, new work permits, their applications were refused. So it's really hard at the moment where the temporary workers can get support that they needed. Hence, you know, um, 
the more it becomes urgent and important for our campaign calling for the Canadian government to provide residence status to all temporary workers who are here in Canada so that they would have access you know, to all these benefits, including uh, emergency packages and access to healthcare. Um, we have some champions in the House of Commons in terms of you know, providing assistance and calling on the different ministers to act on these issues but even them are finding some difficulty, a lot of difficulty, in fact, in making sure that, you know, this immediate, immediate needs of the workers are responded to. Um, caregivers who are almost finishing their 24 months to be able to become eligible to apply for permanent residency, but because of the pandemic, they, you know, they were terminated or laid off, the clock, you know, the government has stopped the clock in terms of uh, finishing the 24 months. And we are arguing that they shouldn't be penalized, you know, for not finishing the 24 months because they were laid off. Um, so these are some of, you know, the, some of the lived experiences that we're hearing from workers. Um, undocumented workers uh, continue to to be very vulnerable and in precarious situation because again, they're not able to access any support. So the more it becomes urgent, you know, for us to, to act on this, as Jennifer mentioned in the beginning, we have this uh, short term period where we can really make a change in terms of urging the government to provide residency status to the workers who are here in Canada. Thanks, Shannon. All right, so now is your moment, folks. Um, both Connie and Jennifer and Reg are all still here who um, can speak to what they spoke about. Um, and so do folks have questions that you want to direct towards the speakers. I wondered, Renaud, if we could, if we could hear anything about the particular situation in Quebec um, around migrant workers, whether you have anything to share from how it's playing out there. If and anyone else wants perhaps to add a comment or a question, um, we'll, we'll watch for her, her typing in the chat. So in case not everyone can see the chat, Renaud has written, she doesn't have a microphone, uh, but some people in Quebec have some concern about migrant workers, but the situation is the same in Quebec as other parts of Canada. Well, and Connie, I was just thinking, um, I understand New Brunswick is closed to migrant workers. Is that still the case? Um, yes, uh, the premier um, in New Brunswick closed uh, the the province and did not allow, especially the the seasonal agricultural workers to come and work for the season. And this has created a lot of problems both for the employers and also for the workers who are almost uh, on the plane uh, to come to to New Brunswick. So, and Premier Higgs, you know, volunteered to work in the fields. Um, it because some of those workers would have been coming year after year and expected to, to come to work the season. Yeah, and going back to the same employer. Yeah, I'm, I, and it's not like there aren't real needs to have things done, like fish processing and issues in the plants, right? I, I saw an article yesterday that said that they were going to look to middle school and high school students to do the work, and that just seems like you know, to replace experienced workers with um, folks who, with t teenagers doesn't make that great a plan. Yes. <laughs> doesn't sound like a very good plan. <laughs> well, um, that particular, that particular uh, plant actually is based in Kapile. And, you know, they were not, uh, they're very frustrated of the premier's decision not to allow or, or to close, you know, the province of, from 
agricultural or seasonal workers coming in. And, and so his son, uh, who is in high school, uh, started to, you know, wanted to say, started to work at the plant and his friends are coming in to help out, right? But you're right. These are, even if the government consider this as a low skilled uh, category, but processing lobsters and seafoods is extremely a skilled work. Um, so Capile, uh, no, this, this a particular uh, company actually in Capile is planning to move to Nova Scotia because of the premier's decision to ban temporary workers to, uh, to come in. I also heard from, you know, on two fish plants in PEI, this is the South Shore seafood, uh, seafood uh, processing plant in PEI and also in uh, Tignish PEI that they were expecting about 150 workers coming from overseas for the season and they were not allowed to come in. Well, not that the province has made a position, but because of travel ban and all of this, uh, they were not able to come in. So um, the processing plants in PEI in New Brunswick, and I would say the whole of Maritimes is, is in crisis at the moment in terms of, you know, workers being able to, to come and do work. So we'd like to encourage people to write letters to your government representatives. And there are details on the website that can give you some idea of some wording and some points to make, as well as the particular addresses to write letters to, letters or emails. Um, hi, I'm Abigail. I'm from Victoria, BC. I, I work for Here Magazine and um, uh, I recently arrived in Canada in 2018 to take up my master's at Royal Roads. So a lot of our membership in the magazine are international students. And so their spouses are temporary foreign workers as well. So we've faced a lot of difficulties in terms of accessing services as well, because they recently unveiled C CSB for students, but that's, that doesn't include international students. So. Um, a lot of the, the students who were laid off also do not qualify for CERB. And so the city now is offering some sort of gift cards for international students who don't qualify under these um, services. And then, of course, there's some issue around um, the spouses who are in their home countries not being able to come here because it's not essential travel. And so the mother, for example, is left with three other children who are also international students. So they, they don't have the support network and they don't have um, access to services such as childcare because they're not PR, uh, they don't have that status. So um, is there some sort of support that you also provide specifically for international students? And we've been told, you know, that because we don't, we can't vote yet, we don't have a voice. You know, I've been webinars like that, like you're an international student, you can't vote, you don't have a voice, you know? So <laughs> is there some sort of um, advice or what? Like I know some international students have banded and we did put out a petition also for ourselves here in BC, but any advice to get, you know, response from the government? Um. Thank you very much, Abigail, for sharing that because you know that the CESB, this um, uh, the Canadian Emergency Response for Students, at the beginning we thought that that is for international students. Mm -hmm. So you know, sharing sharing with us today clarifies that this actually excludes international students, and there has been a lot of you know, announcements, pronouncements by the government that international students are protected. So um, if you can share with us the petition that, you know, you have started or some, some of you have started, we can, we can amplify that. And also in Victoria, you can reach out to um, Elizabeth Welch. Elizabeth is a pastor or a priest. Uh, at the Anglican Church in Cadboro. Okay. She 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 joined uh, the last webinar, 
and would be very, you know, very much welcoming, you know, to hear your story and talk to you and lead you to, you know, the groups and agencies in Victoria who are providing this service. And meantime, we will amplify here uh, at Cairo, at the national level, you know, the situation of international workers. Sorry, thank you. Students. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. So I'll do that. I put Connie's email in the chat too, so you can have see. Yeah. I mean, in a certain way, um, international students are essential uh, to actually the functioning of our universities. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, the university's situation has restructured uh, to depend on the presence of international students uh, for the, the working of the whole. And so it's, it is really critical. And you're right. I mean, we, we've got global families. We've got folks uh, all over the globe. And in the, my sense is that in the proposal that uh, was put forward in Portugal, it would have swept in not just um, migrant workers, but migrants, which would have captured international students as well. Uh, is that right, Connie? Is that? Yes. Yeah. So it's, it's basically saying that in this situation, you need to shelter in the place where you are. This is the place that you are, and therefore you need the rights and benefits that are accorded to this place because you, you are not in your other place, right? And I think that that's really the message we keep having to say. For, this, for safety reasons, you can't travel, people can't travel, so they need to be able to access the rights that are available in their particular and specific yeah. communities, yeah. yeah. And Abigail, I would also suggest that you connect or a group of you connect with, you know, some members of the parliament there. Uh, Randall Garrison is, uh, is He's a good guy. For you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he is. And, um, so you've worked with him already? Yeah. Uh, we know him. We, we've worked with him. Um, but we've been trying to get our message across to MP Laurel Collins. So, but I don't know, like even the messaging itself, you know, when the international students are always left out, I think they have this impression that because we're international students, we have a lot of money, mm. but that's not really the case. Yeah. A lot of us are struggling to just to pay our tuition just because we want a good education. So, yeah. Yeah. And the fact that the Canadian government has issued you the permit, you know, as international student and also issued you a uh, a work permit, you become their responsibility. You become our responsibility to make sure that you know you get access to support and services. Um, so again, going back to what Jennifer has mentioned and our call for the Canadian government to provide residency status to all people who are here in Canada includes international students. So you have to you have to ask your other, you know, your colleagues and friends to, you know, about this uh, campaign and support. So to everyone, we do have just maybe two minutes here if there was a last question to Connie or one of the speakers. And if not, Connie, I will give the last word to you. Um, I'm wondering before we, yeah, we are trying, I'm wondering if we can hear from M. Blanton. I wonder who, <laughs> if you can just, you know, briefly introduce yourself and yeah, uh, what is uh, your interest, you know? Um. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I didn't mean to be secretive. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm Marta Blandon. I am with the Colombian Action Solidarity Alliance, and I've been mm -hmm. interested on in this topic because, as you know, the Colombian community living in Toronto is quite large, and it's always important to be aware of what's going on. Uh, that was pretty much my interest. I don't really have much information to provide about how bad the situation is. All I know is the Latin American Food Bank has been very, very busy providing food for our entire community. So I can imagine the situation all across the province. Um, but definitely this um, um, 
virtual conferences are very important for all of us to keep updated. And um, yes, please let us know ahead so then we can forward the information and include more participants in, in these sessions. Uh, they are very informative and very important. Thank you so much for giving me the chance to speak. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Marta. And you know, if you know, uh, from your community who are on temporary status and are migrant workers and are facing, you know, challenges and difficulty, you can, you know, you can uh, ask them to reach out to, to us and some other migrant workers organizations in the city so that uh, their situation, uh, um, we know about the situation and we can um, respond um, to, to their needs. Um, so just in closing, uh, Carlos, we are very pleased, you know, uh, for the interest and, and the engagement that uh, participants in, in, in today's webinar and also in the previous webinars uh, around the situation of migrant workers and trying to find ways in being able to support these needs. Uh, and not only in terms of material, you know, material needs, but being able to to amplify their voices and their situation to the policymakers, to the government, so that uh, they are able to respond uh, and, and be able to provide the support that these workers uh, need. So um, thank you so much for participating at today's webinar. And we will you know, let you know when the next uh, one would be. And this, this I would say, uh, before the summer, just to provide again an update on on what's the situation, what is the government doing, and how's our campaign in terms of you know um, pushing for residency for all uh, workers, migrant workers, including international students who are here in Canada today. So a tentative date that we had talked about is June 16th, which is again a uh, Tuesday afternoon. Uh, rather than three weeks apart, that is four weeks because of an, uh, another conflict. But um, so you can watch for uh, notices about that and we would have it on this same type of channel and be putting out links for you to sign up. Yes, and, and, and meantime, you know, from now till June 16, uh, keep, keep on logging on to the Kairos website because we would be uh, posting updates and stories as you know, uh, we continue to hear from, uh, from the workers, from the migrant workers. So thank you so much and have a wonderful day.